Not too long ago, Jordan Peterson was reported to have warned that no one will escape the purview of government surveillance as new technology emerges while making a statement to a congressional committee. And this got me to think, you are being watched in the spiritual realm. There are eyes on you. On this side, the devil is watching to see where your affections are so that he can tempt you even more. And on this side, you're being watched by heaven. Your every deed is being recorded. Your every word is being noted down. On this side, demons are watching you to see if you'll give them any opportunity to enter into your life. And on this side, you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses in heaven. Imagine you are standing there in front of God's throne, and you're being accused by the devil of every single thing you have ever done wrong. What would you do? What would you say? Revelation 12 verse 10 says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Did you know that this is how Satan operates when he attacks you as a believer? In law enforcement, a sting operation is a deceptive operation designed to catch a person attempting to commit a crime. Have you ever watched one of those movies where a policeman provides someone, or a would-be criminal, an opportunity to commit a crime? Well, many believers don't know that the devil works in a very similar way. He'll provide someone, a would-be sinner, which is all of us, with an opportunity to commit a sin. And if we fall into that temptation and fall into that sin, he gathers evidence against us and presents it to the courts of heaven. He stands as he accuses us of being sinners, of betraying the love and mercy of Christ. But even though he does this, remember that the Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Always remember that. Now, make no mistake about this. The devil and his demons are always watching. They are always waiting for you to fall. They're always plotting how they can place the most effective stumbling block in front of you. They're always scheming on different ways to make you fall into sin. All so that the devil can stand and accuse you. Whenever we stumble and fall, we must be quick to repent. We must quickly run to seek God's forgiveness, to seek His cleansing power from. And let me tell you that the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, speaks a better word on our behalf than any accusation from the devil. Despite the fact that the enemy slanders us before God day and night, Jesus Christ silences every single one of those accusations because He paid the price for our sins on the cross. Can God isolate you in order to transform you? Perhaps the better question is, does isolation lead to transformation? Well, I think to answer these questions, we have to look in the Bible. The first case we'll look at is Moses. Moses was a man who experienced many supernatural things in his life. He had an encounter with God through the burning bush. He was right at the front of the extraordinary parting of the Red Sea. In Exodus 19, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to meet with God. Moses witnessed Mount Sinai being enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down upon it in fire. In Exodus 33, Moses would go into a tent and a pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And here's how much of a special relationship Moses had with God. The Bible says in Exodus 33, verse 11, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. But with such a special relationship, 
Did God ever isolate Moses? Was Moses ever alone? With no one else but God around? He certainly was. Exodus 34 verse 28 says, So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses was alone with God for forty days and forty nights. The Bible doesn't reveal everything about what went on between Moses and God, but after this period of isolation, Moses was not the same because the Bible tells us in Exodus 34, verse 29 to 30 that, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Such was the transformation in Moses that it was visible. His face was shining. So here is the first case that we can clearly see how God can use isolation to transform a person. You are isolated from others so you can be alone with God and through that encounter, you are inwardly transformed and outwardly changed. The second case is Joseph. Joseph encountered a different kind of isolation. Although he had a family, he was set apart from his family. Although he had brothers, he was isolated and separated from his home, from his father, all because of the hate he received from his brothers. Because of Potiphar's wife, Joseph lost his freedom and was imprisoned. But all of the isolation and separation that Joseph experienced was leading him to a destination that God only knew. Sometimes isolation is painful. Sometimes isolation is, in fact, God's preparation. In the case of Joseph, God allowed him to be separated from his way of life, his people, his family and loved ones. God allowed it so that one day, Joseph would save their lives. Now, the third case I want to highlight is the unnamed woman with an issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. For 12 years, she endured this terrible illness. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. She exhausted every possible avenue that she could, and yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. But here's where her story takes a dramatic turn. Picture this woman, an outcast of society, isolated from everyone. She suffered with this issue of blood for years and years. This woman had run out of resources. She had run out of friends and run out of favors. She had nowhere else to go, but then, one day, Jesus Christ is passing by, and the Amplified Translation of Mark chapter 5, verse 27 to 29 says, She had heard reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. For she thought, If I just touch his clothing, I will get well. Immediately her flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Could it be that God allowed this woman to be isolated and cut off from society so that he could demonstrate his healing power? Could it be that God allowed this woman to be seen as an outcast by all of the community only so that God can show that he can restore anyone, no matter how bad the situation looks? Now, consider what you may be going through. It may be painful. It may be lonely. But what if God has allowed this season of isolation in your life because He knows people are watching you? And when He turns your situation around, your testimony can be seen and not just heard. The fourth case of isolation is our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was alone in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. No food, no disciples. Jesus was alone and He was even tested and tempted by the devil. Satan tempted Jesus three times, and each time Jesus referred to the Word of God. The devil knocked three times, and each time he was answered with the Word of God. The devil offered riches. He said, if it's money you want, worship me. If it's power you want, worship me. Jesus was offered the kingdoms of this world by Satan, but Jesus was content. He was full of God's Word. He was satisfied with God's word. Three times Jesus responded by saying, It is written, and he referred to the word of God. 
This season of isolation for Jesus, I believe, was a spiritual battle. His fleshly body was denied all that it wanted in order for him to focus on God. His body was at its weakest, and the devil tempted him, but his spirit was strong enough to resist. After this period of isolation, Jesus' ministry began. Now, let me pose this question to you. We will not ever experience the same kind of isolation and testing that Jesus did. But perhaps we will experience a season where we find ourselves isolated and tempted. Tempted to sin. Tempted to walk away from God. Tempted to give in to unholy desires. This is spiritual warfare. This is a season of isolation that will either strengthen your faith or take you backwards. In the book of James, we're told to count it as joy when we face trial and adversity. However, for many of us, we see adversity as a negative. How can something that seems so hard in the moment be something we find joy in? Well, it is because God uses that adversity to shape and mold us. God grows us into what He wants us to be by the hard things we face. The path that you face may be hard, but the calling God has for you is higher. With the journey of a thorny path comes a man or woman of God with a high calling. The Bible is full of people who had challenging paths but high callings. The most notable of those people would be Jesus. From the very beginning of his ministry, he faced challenges. Jesus went into the wilderness to seek God and fast for 40 days. While fasting, Satan showed up and tried to tempt Jesus into sinning. While traveling with his disciples, people constantly judged and persecuted Jesus. Many times, the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, tried to make him look bad. His own family and hometown rejected him. On multiple occasions, people tried to stone Jesus. They even tried to throw him off a cliff. Then, of course, everyone turned their back on him. Crowds of people screamed, crucify him. In his greatest moment of need, when on trial to be killed by crucifixion, his disciples turned their back on Jesus and ran. Most notably, though he never sinned, he became sin. As Isaiah 53 says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus was crushed for the sins of the world. The judgment that we deserve, Jesus took on our behalf. If that is not a tough road, I don't know what is. Yet with the hard road came an even higher calling. His tough road made way for sinners to walk in a relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Due to the tough road that Jesus walked, those who, by grace through faith, trust in Jesus can now be called the righteousness of God. While Jesus walked the most challenging road, the following saints walked a road marked with trial and adversity as well. Paul did not have an easy life. As a matter of fact, he left an easy life to become a follower of Jesus. From the moment Paul decided to follow Jesus, he faced trial after trial. Paul talks about his life as a follower of Jesus in 2 Corinthians. Five times he received 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day he was adrift at sea. Paul was on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst. Paul, often without food, in cold and exposure. I imagine he went through more in a week than many will face in a lifetime. 
However, his tough road led to the immediate advancement of the gospel. Due to the ministry of Paul, thousands were saved and the gospel spread quickly. Joseph in the Old Testament is another example of a hard path leading to an even higher calling. As a young boy, he was his father's favorite son. The other ten brothers were jealous of Joseph. Because of this jealousy, they threw him in a pit and sold him as a slave. Joseph's father, Jacob, thought he was dead. Little did he know, hundreds of miles away, Joseph was slaving away for the Pharaoh. While not ideal, Joseph did work his way up the ladder in Egypt. However, this was abruptly put to an end when Joseph was unjustly accused of rape. He was thrown in prison and left to rot. Despite this tough road, God used Joseph immensely. After many years of sitting in prison, the Pharaoh of Egypt learned that Joseph could interpret dreams. This led to Joseph telling Pharaoh through dream interpretation that there would be seven years of crop abundance and then seven years of famine. Joseph was then put in a position of authority in Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh. Joseph was able to save the people of Egypt from this famine by using his authority to save crops. He even saved his now 11 brothers and father, Jacob, from this famine. His hard path led to a higher calling. So you may feel as if you are walking a hard path right now. Maybe, like Jesus, you feel abandoned by those nearest to you. Maybe, like Paul, your life went from ease to utter chaos. Maybe, like Joseph, you have been unjustly accused. Your life has been marked with trial and adversity. However, God is going to use this hard path to shape you into the man or woman of God He has called you to. Every late night you spent crying, and early morning you felt hopeless, God will use to shape you. This shaping He will use to give you an even higher calling. Everything you have gone through will be for something of significant importance in the kingdom of God. Your path may be harder, but your calling will be higher. To be chosen. You see, the word chosen means to pick out. It means that a choice has to be made and you make a selection. For example, God can lead you and direct you, but ultimately you choose a husband or a wife. You choose the type of church and doctrine you want to follow. You choose to be a law-abiding citizen or not. But how do we answer the question, am I chosen by God? Am I called by God? Have I been picked out for something, for a purpose? Have I been divinely selected for something? The first thing I discovered when trying to find out if I'm chosen by God is that God's choices are not by our standards, nor are they according to our understanding. Let's imagine a man. A man who has a hatred for God, a strong hatred for the things of God, and he's so overcome by this rage and fury that he decides to persecute Christians. He decides to make the lives of many Christians uncomfortable and difficult. His eyes are filled with rage at the sight of a Christian man or woman who lifts their hands up to praise the name of the Lord. This man is described to have ravaged, to have damaged the church in Jerusalem at one point. Can you imagine such a man? If you saw a man like that, let's be honest, many of us would think that he's the Antichrist. Many of us would think this man is possessed by the devil. <laughs> well, this man was Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. But why would God use such a person? Why would God choose to use a person who persecuted Christians? I believe that God wanted to demonstrate that His ways are not like our ways. He can take the worst of the worst. He can take a sinner, an outcast in society, and turn them into a powerful man or woman of God. So perhaps you're there. You're there simply wondering, am I chosen by God? Am I chosen to do something? Am I chosen to do something? Well, the Bible says in John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit 
and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I believe the biggest reason that we ask the question, am I chosen by God, is because we have not invested enough time in our relationship with the Lord for us to really tap into our calling. It's because we haven't really surrendered fully in our hearts and minds. And I mean surrender to the point where chasing God becomes like an obsession for us. There's a gift inside you. But you need to cultivate that gift. John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Meaning that as I decrease, as my personal ambitions decrease, as my worldly possessions decrease, then the God inside me will increase. The Holy Spirit will increase and begin to operate without measure in my life. So you are chosen by God. It's up to you to answer that call. And perhaps you're someone like me who always used to think that God only uses a select few. I thought that he handpicked the best of us. You know those who can articulate themselves well. Those who can speak with boldness and eloquently. I used to see preachers like Billy Graham and Miles Monroe and think, those are the kind of people God uses. And if you've ever thought along these lines, then let me tell you that this is not the right way of thinking. God has called all of us to perform different duties and tasks in his kingdom. Don't ever compare your calling to someone else. Be faithful to the Lord regardless of where you start off. And I would especially like to speak to someone who says, oh well, God would never choose me. What could God do with someone like me? I've done some bad things. There's plenty better people out there that he could choose. If you are there and feel that way, perhaps Saul of Tarsus becoming the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest examples that you are never too far beyond the reach of Jesus Christ. He can use you. Regardless of your mistakes, your sins or your past, God can use you regardless of where you were born, regardless of your gender or race. You see, the Apostle Paul is one of the most influential voices in the Bible. But here's what he said in Acts 26 from verse 9. He said, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul details the evil things he did. He took the lives of many Christians. He took believers and in his hatred tried to make them blaspheme and speak against the Lord. How could God use such a person? Well, he did, and he still does. Paul did some despicable things, but he still had an encounter with God. He performed some horrible deeds, but God still chose him. And so to you, if you are asking whether or not you could ever be chosen by God, the answer is, yes, you can. At times, we equate being chosen by God to people who only preach to thousands and millions around YouTube. But you could be chosen to be an enabler, someone who enables the gospel to be spread. You could be a supporter, someone who offers support in a number of ways, enabling the gospel to be spread, all of which are vital roles. There are some people like Billy Graham, like Miles Monroe, people who have a greater calling, yes, but the sacrifice required of them is greater too. Then there are those who are chosen to be behind the scenes. They are away from the camera, away from the lights, but their call is also just as important. God is bigger than the men and women we have seen preaching. The body of Christ is greater than just a few people. And we are all called by God in some way. Someone once said to me, I wonder if the problem isn't that 
God is not speaking, but rather, it's the fact that we're not listening. Now, I found this to be powerful because I thought about my own personal relationship with the Lord and how often do we go to God with requests? How often do we go to the Lord with our hands out wanting something? But, dear friend, I believe there ought to come a time in our lives where we go to God with the intention of hearing Him. There has to come a time in your life as a Christian where your prayer is, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me concerning my family. Speak to me concerning my plans, my dreams and ambitions. Speak to me concerning your will for my life. Now, how does God speak? And what are some of the signs that God is speaking to you? Well, God can speak to us by impressing something on our spirit. Many people have testified saying they had a strong urge to wake up and pray for someone, only to find that the person they did pray for was in desperate need of help or aid. Others have testified how they had an unusual strong feeling and urge to go a certain direction, in a different direction to their usual way, only to find that if they had gone that way, there was danger around the corner. I have even heard of people saying they were uneasy. They sensed something was off when a certain person came around, only to find out later on that that person was involved in occultic activity. So you see, the Lord can speak to you by impressing something on your spirit. Here are two verses that we can see this happening. Acts 17 verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And also in Acts 18 verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. On both occasions, God, or the Spirit of God, made an impression on Paul that provoked, compelled, and called him to action. And to put this into context, we need to understand that Romans 8 verse 16 tells us the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, and in other translations say, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit, or joins with our spirit. This could be called intuition, impression, inner consciousness, or inspiration, but all in all, it comes in a number of different ways. Another way that God speaks is through a still small voice, an inner voice deep within your heart. Have you ever had a moment where you've done something wrong, you've lied, and a few moments later, there is a voice deep in your heart that tells you, that's a lie, tell the truth. Or perhaps you have spoken some harsh words to someone, and that inner voice speaks to you and says, you can't speak to someone like that, apologize. This, I believe, is the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit, gentle but firm, convicting but never condemning, peaceful, never forceful. He's always leading you into truth, always leading you to do right in the sight of the Lord, even when no one is looking. In 1 Kings 19 verse 12, Elijah encounters the Lord and the Bible says, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And this is one of the many ways that God speaks in a still, small voice. Furthermore, God can speak to you through people. And by people, I don't just mean anyone. I mean through the counsel of godly, prayerful people. The Bible in Proverbs 15 verse 22 tells us plans go wrong 
for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. God can and often does confirm His message to you through the counsel of other God-fearing believers. When other people who have also sought after God's wisdom are in agreement and encourage you to take the step that you feel led to take, when they confirm the direction you're considering, it's a powerful sign that we're on the right path. How do you know that God is leading you? During their exodus from Egypt, the children of Israel were led by God with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Matthew 4, verse 1, we're told that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But when it comes to our lives, how do we know that God is leading us? How do we know that we are walking on the path that God wants for us? Well, I believe when you notice that God is speaking to you through His Word, and when you find that other people are confirming it, this is a strong sign that you are walking in the path that God wants for you. The Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word. One of the most clearest ways that God leads us is through His word. The pages of the Holy Scriptures hold timeless wisdom and they reveal God's divine plan and purpose. The Amplified Translation of Proverbs 15 verse 22 says something very powerful. It says, Without consultation and wise advice, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they are established and succeed. God can and often confirms His message to you through the counsel of other God-fearing believers. When other people who have also sought after God's wisdom, when they confirm the direction we're considering, it's a powerful sign that we're on the right path. So it's important to remember that God speaks not only through the stillness of our hearts, but also through the voices of those around us. But what about those times when you're going through difficult circumstances? When you are in a difficult season, do not be discouraged when the path becomes rocky. Don't be discouraged because trials and tribulations often mark the very path God has set before us. The Bible is filled with stories of great men and women who faced adversity on their journeys of faith. Just as the Israelites wandered through the desert before reaching the Promised Land, so too may our trials be preparing us for the destination God has ordained. In James 1, verse 2 to 3, we read, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. When you find yourself facing challenges, remember that God is using these difficulties to shape you into the vessel He intends you to be. The final point that I want to highlight is that when you feel as though God is prompting you to move into a certain direction, and you still have peace despite knowing every step of God's plan. This is the beauty of divine guidance. It often lies in the supernatural peace that accompanies it. There are times when we are called to make decisions without knowing all the details. And yet, a profound sense of calm envelops us. This peace is a gift from God a sign that He is leading us. In Philippians 4, verse 7, we're assured that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you are at a crossroads and the choice before you aligns with God's will, you will experience a peace that surpasses logic. It's as though God's gentle hand is guiding your heart and mind toward His perfect plan. I would like to give you three illustrations about some of the signs you should look out for to confirm that God is leading you. The first is the open door. Imagine a person standing before multiple closed doors, uncertain of which path to take. Suddenly, one door swings open 
and invites them forward. And when this door opens, none of their enemies are able to close it. None of the devil's schemes are able to close this door. In Revelation 3 verse 8, Jesus speaks of an open door that no one can shut, emphasizing his authority to guide us. Just as open doors signify God's leading us, closed doors can also be used by the Lord to redirect us toward his perfect plan. The second illustration is the confirming witnesses. Imagine a courtroom where multiple witnesses testify to the same truth, reinforcing its validity. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1, Paul refers to this principle of confirming witnesses. Just as witnesses strengthen a case, God may provide confirming signs through his word, prayer, peace in your heart, an encouraging word from a fellow believer, and trusted mentors. The final illustration is what I want to call the unlikely circumstances. Consider a person in an unexpected situation, seemingly unrelated to their plans. Yet through this unexpected turn, they find themselves aligned with God's purpose. In the story of Joseph in Genesis, his journey from slavery to leadership exemplifies God's ability to use unlikely circumstances to fulfill his plans. Joseph would have never thought his journey would end how it did, but God was leading him even when his circumstances were difficult. This too could be the case in your life. And so, dear friend, discerning God's leading requires open hearts tuned to his voice and his word. The word of God is so very important when it comes to guiding us toward recognizing his direction. Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. We need to rely on the wisdom that can only be found in God's word and we need to acknowledge that his ways are higher than our ways. In Psalm 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. With hearts surrendered to his leading, we can confidently follow the path that he unfolds before us. With faith and discernment, we can navigate life's journey hand in hand with our heavenly guide.